Welcome to the Coach Barnabas podcast. It's time to take a few minutes and leave behind the stuff that drains us and recharge our batteries with some encouragement and insight. Finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. Thanks once again, Nigel, my disembodied British voice of sophistication. Welcome back. This is episode number four of the Coach Barnabas podcast. Uh, thanks again for joining me. I and for those of you, this might be your first time. Uh, welcome. I, I hope uh, you enjoy uh, we're, what we're going to talk about today. There are three episodes um, that preceded this one, uh, so it won't take you a long time to kind of catch up if this is your first time joining us. But uh, for those of you who have uh, who have perhaps uh, listened to the first few, um, I appreciate you coming back. Um, it's been a little. It's been about a week or so since I've last uh, connected with you, and I've been looking forward to this. Um, at the suggestion of my wife, I'm going to talk about something that, um, is very personal to me and, and something that, um, a number of years ago, I'd never would imagine I'd be talking about. Um, but it had, I think it's, um, it's something that we can all relate to. Um, at least that's been my experience when I have talked about it. So, uh, we'll just kind of dive right in, uh, going back to my youth, I mean, literally, further back than I can remember, um, I started developing a skin condition called vitiligo. And uh, I had very naturally dark skin. I kind of had that year-round tan thing. I was born with that. Uh, it was great. I was also born with a full head of hair. So lots changed since then. Um, but I had this beautiful, you know, dark skin. And um, But at a very, very early age, um, the pigmentation on my skin started to deteriorate and there were white spots mostly on my hands that were just kind of developing and spreading um and by the time i hit school age of all the times um it started becoming very very noticeable um especially juxtaposed to my dark skin there were patches of of just white white skin where the pigmentation basically was dead um and you know, at that age, anything that makes you different, anything that makes you stand out from quote unquote normal, uh, kids are just going to notice and pick on and ask you uncomfortable questions. And of course, at that age, I had no idea what was happening to me. I didn't know it was abnormal. I didn't know it was, you know, weird or, or whatever, but I had to deal with it. It's just kind of, um, what are you going to do? What are your alternatives? Um, but as I got older, I, I grew more and more, more self-conscious about it. Uh, it bothered me and kids would, would notice and, and make fun and, and that sort of thing. And, and just when you're starting your social development, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and I remember as a little boy, uh, at the end of the day, you know, maybe one after it was bedtime and I would just cry in bed and pray as best I knew how at the time. And just wonder why God made me weird. Why he didn't make me normal like everybody else? Um, and it was hard. Um, and as I grew up, I my hands were always buried in my pockets, and um, you know, it just I tried to do anything I could to avoid attention of any kind. And I've always been kind of a natural introvert, and I honestly don't know how much of that is reinforced or was contributed to by you know this. Um, but you know, it definitely did affect me. Um, it, it messed with me. And then when you get into junior high and high school, um, you know, it's, I'm still trying to lead a normal life. I played sports. I was active with music. Um, I even started a little rock band in junior high and we were very popular and, and you know, it was, it was awesome, you know, so I had a good life growing up. I don't want to mislead you and think I had, you know, it was it was traumatic and and tragic or anything like that, but it was there were challenges. Um, and by the time I got to high school, I'd see I'd be walking around the halls, and you know, upperclassmen and you know, football players, big guys and stuff like that would would call me a leper. Um, throughout my life, people would question and ask me. You know, kids would ask me if if I'd been burned in a fire um, in high school. Uh, there was one teacher who literally in front of the class called me a zebra. Um, which, you know, from kids, you kind of expect that from, from teachers and adults and leaders and things like that. It really threw me and I didn't know how to respond to that. Uh, but it was harsh. Um, 
and so it just kind of followed me through life and um and again it's always been a source of of insecurity it it really contributed to a lot a lot of insecurity in my life my personality um and i dealt with it um not always well i mean i'm not going to lie to you i didn't say ah it's no big deal it, it hurt and it was hard for me it affected me uh and then um you know it, as about uh, about 18 years old i i kind of discovered for my life singing and um as luck would have it the only way you'd really sing in front of a crowd was to be in front of a crowd holding a microphone with your hand sorry i have a little injured pinky so i call this my bionic finger uh anyway um i'd hold a microphone so there's your hand right out in front of everybody. And by this time, it, it kind of spread. It was like on my elbows a little bit. It was kind of, there was a patch on my throat, um, which, you know, again, all these things are just impossible to hide. Uh, and then you're standing in front of a crowd and you're drawing attention to yourself because you're performing or something. And it, you know, it's just weird how my life kind of unrolled or unveiled itself, whatever you want to say. Um because again, being a natural introvert and not really wanting attention yet, I had abilities and things I enjoyed doing that put me in front of people. Um, and I, I mentioned in the, uh, you know, in one of the earlier episodes of, of the podcast that uh, sometimes I, I find myself with conflicting priorities. One is being an introvert and just kind of being comfortable without the attention. And yet uh, I enjoy doing something like this, you know, podcasting or, or broadcasting and things like that. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. Uh, let's just call it what it is. Uh, it would be easier and more comfortable for me to just kind of blend in the background. But um, yet, you know, I have another passion as well, and that's communication and, and talking and sharing things with people and encouraging people. So that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. Um, so to kind of fast forward um, into my adult life, um, vitiligo, as is known to do, spread. Um, and you can, you know, you may be able to see if you're watching on the YouTube, you might be able to see, you know, there's, you know, different colors, even now that I'm bald, uh, it's easier to see on my head and my face, there's patches. Um, I'm looking down at my monitor right here. That's why I'm looking down for reference uh of course on my hands in in my entire skin has lightened uh you may have noticed that like you know michael jackson uh said he had vitiligo and and he went obviously from being uh you know an obvious african-american black man to you know almost people used to say he had his skin bleached and i, I don't don't know whether that's true or not but vitiligo will do that it will wash out your skin um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, something I've had to deal with all my life. It's not gone away. It's spread. It, it's, it's gotten worse and, but there's no pain involved, uh, physically. Um, there's no discomfort. There's none of that stuff. It's all psychological really. Um, and so it's had its, its place in my life. And, and again, I had a lot of insecurities, but you know, later on in life, um, you know, it, it affected me socially. Um, you know, it's just, it's hard not to, but later on in life, I ended up meeting my wife and my wife is one who, um, she used to love when she was a, a teenage girl, she used to love David Bowie. And one of the things she loved about David Bowie is he had mismatched eyes. They were different colors. Um, and so she kind of likes, you know, little differences or idiosyncrasies or, or um, things that separate us from being quote unquote normal. And, you know, at first I was very insecure about what she might think when, when we were first getting together and um, she just, she never batted an eye. And um, as, as we did talk about it, um, she either, you know, she would say, I, I don't even notice, but when you draw my attention to it, I actually like it. She likes the fact that it's different. Um, so, you know, it's it's funny how things work out. And I, I as I've mentioned before, my faith just leads me to uh, nothing but the conclusion that God knows what he's doing. And to match me up with somebody who just doesn't care about things that plagued me um, 
and and at least psychologically scarred me growing up to match me up with somebody who not only doesn't care but actually kind of likes it and wouldn't change me for anything when it comes to that there's probably other things she'd like to change but let's be real you know that's <laughs> that's marriage um but at, at least physically um in my skin condition that i've dealt with literally all my life uh she she loves me the way i am and because of the way i am and that gives me perhaps a a unique insight and um a sensitivity to people and that's really why i kind of said all that to say this um as i got older and you know here's a little illustration um I grew up in the West Coast, as I've mentioned before, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one of my lifelong dreams was to visit New York one day. Literally, I had dreams of going to New York, seeing Statue of Liberty and the Empire State Building and all this stuff. And uh, this was after 9-11 and uh, an opportunity came up where I can go to New York and it was all expenses paid pretty much. And so uh, I, I'm an adult, I'm living on my own and I happen to share this with my parents. My mom was worried about terrorists and planes and all this other stuff. And, but I was determined to go. And, and this was about four or five years after 9-11. Um, and I just remember talking to her and say, you know, I'm not gonna let terrorists keep me from something I've always dreamed of doing. Now, what does it have to do with this? Here's what it has to do with, is as I got older, uh, you know, I didn't want the so-called terrorists of, you know, being worried about what other people thought to affect me. Um, as I got older and matured, um, you know, I just determined that I wasn't going to live in fear of what people would think. Or, you know, as, as you're walking down the street, you see people look at you and in your head, you're thinking they think you're a freak. They think you're bizarre. They, you know, whatever. Um, and as you get older, you just get to the point to where it's like, let them think whatever they want. They don't know me. Um, and so I guess that's where I want to come with this is that I think in a variety of ways, we all have our insecurities, you know, whether it's we're carrying too much weight or we're too skinny or we're too short or we're too tall or whatever the case is, uh, our hair's this way. We wish it was that way um, or in any way. Um we all have our things, you know, or maybe it's not a physical insecurity, but maybe it's an emotional one or, you know, a psychological one or professional one or you name it. Um, I think we all have things that we struggle with and, and find insecurities with and, um, and we think we're defined by those things. And I just really want to say everything I've said up to this point to say this is to just accept who you are and and accept that um what you've gone through is really um something that just makes you stronger and it eventually did that in my life to where i got stronger in in not worrying about what other people think or those who say things that are cruel um maybe they're masking their own insecurity okay um, but I've just found more often than not when I've either shared something like this that people could really relate and take my situation and apply it to themselves and find strength and encouragement um, through identifying with somebody who has also been there and done that. And whatever you may be facing or whatever you've dealt with all your life, or maybe something has happened that, you know, some people have an accident of some kind, they get a scar uh, or something just happens. Uh, later on in life, for me, it's just something I've dealt with my entire life, but maybe it's something that's happened in your adult life later in years um, that makes you feel that way. But I just want to, you know, challenge you to not let the terrorists, so to speak, um, keep you from following your dreams, keep you from living a full life, uh, from being who you are, because, you know, that's what makes you you. You're not defined by what people see as they're walking by you down the street, um, you're not defined by any of that superficial stuff. It's who you are on the inside that's going to make a difference in people's life. Um, and that's been my focus. And, and as I've shared with you before, um, the reason I'm doing this is because the thing that fuels me the most, the thing that brings me the most satisfaction and fulfillment is encouraging people um, and helping people achieve their dreams and their goals and to uh, see themselves in a different light and to wrap them in courage. That's what encouragement means. And that's what fuels me. And 
uh, you know, to be able to hopefully connect with you on this on this level. Uh, hopefully that will be a message that you'll take from this. And and remember, the Bible says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made by our Creator, Psalm 139. So I believe that. That's and I I've experienced that. And I've experienced that through my wife. I've experienced that through uh, many people in my life. The the positive, encouraging people in my life have far outweighed the people who said cruel things or ignorant things. Um, and I'm just so grateful for that. So that's really what I just kind of want to share with you today. Um, and to hopefully just encourage you to just keep going and let the negativity just brush it off and just really, you know, let yourself love yourself for who you are and and accept it and maybe even use it as something that can help you connect with others and help them who are facing insecurities of their own because there's nobody that can relate to a person with insecurities than somebody who has insecurities. So, um be human and and let that be something that connects you to other people and to be able to say I've been there and done that. I am dealing with it. Let's walk through this together. And I think you'll really find uh, a sense of, uh, you know, connection with people and a sense of accomplishment and helping somebody through what you've gone through, uh, where they are and meet them where they are and, and help them uh, get through it together. So that's what I want to share with you today. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, I hope you'll stick around. If you haven't watched the previous episodes or listened to them, I hope you will. I hope you like uh, what we're talking about, what we're doing. And uh, hopefully you'll continue to join us uh, as we continue on. So thanks so much for, again, for being here. And I just want to, again, remind you to be encouraged and be an encouragement. Have a great time. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining the Coach Barnabas podcast. We'd greatly appreciate your support by liking and subscribing to the podcast and setting up notifications so we can let you know when new episodes are available. We'd love to hear from you. So please leave a comment. Make a difference today.